Every single time I'm about to embark on a new painting journey, particularly when the subject is something as delicate as a white flower, I make a strategic move. I paint a dark backdrop first. You might wonder why. The answer is simple but impactful. Tonal contrast. One of the cornerstone principles of shading and tonality is that when you position a light hue adjacent to a darker one, the light color seems to glow even more than it naturally would. This is because our visual system is wired in a way that it can be easily deceived by high levels of contrast. Having a broad spectrum of tones to contrast against is essential. In the world of painting, terms like value, shade and tone are all relative concepts. You can only really tell if something is light or dark when you put it side by side with other values or colors for comparison. So, by initiating my painting with those deep, dark shades, it sharpens my judgment on the lightness or darkness of the other tones I'll be using. It's like having a tonal roadmap that guides me to pinpoint accuracy, ensuring that the local color of the flower, or whatever subject I'm painting, is precisely as it should be. I love kickstarting the shaping process with the local color of the subject I'm painting. Take a tulip, for example. At its core, it's white, but its surface is streaked with shades of red. When I've got a background already laid out, my go-to move is to start painting the flower by focusing on the lit part of it. I'll apply that local white color first, then tweak it as I go along. Now, you might be thinking, Hey, you said the tulip is white. Well, in the world of realistic painting, white is never just white. The hue of the white actually depends on the color of the light source. Wondering why white isn't simply white? I dove into this topic in one of my earlier videos. So, if you're not sure how to handle the color white in your paintings, I highly recommend you go back and check out that video for some pro tips. Before I even dip my brush, I always whip up a variety of premixed local colors. I typically spend about 20 minutes just before painting to prepare a range of hues, both warm and cool. These mixes serve as my base colors, and I continually tweak them as I go along adjusting the saturation, temperature, and tone depending on what part of the canvas I'm working on at the moment. Originally. I was thinking of using Naples Yellow Light to mix my white paint. It has a low chroma yellow hue, making it a great base for mixing warm light shades. But since I decided to paint the tulip in just one layer, I needed a more opaque color. Unfortunately, Naples Yellow was too transparent and didn't work well in thicker applications. So, I opted to create my local white from other colors. Using Titanium White cadmium yellow deep, and cadmium red deep, I mixed a light warm hue that you can see I'm applying to the illuminated part of the tulip. As you folks who've been following me for a while already know, the flower is lit by natural light. This means that the half shadows are influenced by a secondary light source, the blue sky, making them cooler and bluer. So, I carefully sketch out the areas in half shadow and aim to capture an accurate hue that's noticeably bluer compared to the local color. For the half tones, I essentially used the local warm color as a base and then cooled it down with a light blue hue. The color I used for cooling was premixed and is stored in a tube. I could have used other blues like cobalt or ultramarine to cool the shades, but the problem is, they're too dark. Mixing them with a light warm hue would not only cool it down but also darken it too much. And when you're painting a white flower, you've got to be cautious of extreme contrasts. That's why I'm constantly comparing the values during painting, making sure the halftone area doesn't get too dark. The cooling color I've mixed is composed of ultramarine violet and white, and I always have it ready in a tube. It's not too dark so it cools the hue without darkening the value too much, which is precisely what I need. Sometimes, I also use King's Blue for this purpose. It leans more towards blue than ultramarine violet, allowing me to expand the color range of the halftones from purple tones to cooler blue shades. 
I started off thinking I could complete this straightforward painting with just a single layer of paint. It sounds easy, but as I dived deeper into the creative process, it became clear that a few adjustments would be needed once that initial layer had a chance to dry. I'll get into those details a little later. Now, when I'm tackling a painting in one layer, it's like laying down pieces of a color puzzle. Each and every spot that I touch with my brush needs to have the perfect blend of color hue and value or lightness. This ensures that everything in the painting clicks into place, forming a cohesive visual experience. And just to up the ante, the second my brush hits the canvas, I'm also focused on adding the finer details, striving to make the painting look as polished as possible right from the get-go. Combining white shades with a local red color, like the flower's hue, is particularly challenging. The red color has a darker value and, if blended, can be affected by lighter shades. If I accidentally mix a light color into the red, the red shades will lose their saturation and cool down, something I try to avoid while applying the shades. And that brings us back to the role of underpainting. Sorting out your light and shadow with a monochromatic underpainting can serve as a useful guide for later layers. For example, if there's a white flower in the painting, and its bright section is marked as a 2 on the gray scale, that sets the standard for the colors you'll be applying later, they need to match that value. Direct painting complicates matters further. You've got to get that color absolutely spot on in terms of its lightness, hue, and saturation. You're essentially juggling multiple elements in a single step. And that's why even a rudimentary understanding of color theory is pretty indispensable. Moreover, it's no simple task to craft forms and intricate details all in a single layer. If you've ever studied the works of artists like Anders Zorn or John Singer Sargent, you'll notice they aren't bogged down by tiny details. These artists had a knack for making their brush strokes work double duty. A single stroke could imply a shape or a texture. So, while single layer painting might not be the best approach for those who are detail oriented, it's not impossible to navigate. Like in my case, if you find it hard to hold back on the finer details, there's always the option to revisit and refine them in a second layer after the first has fully dried. I had to go this route when I was working on this particular tulip painting, and it worked out pretty well for me. I started out planning to do a straightforward tulip painting with just one layer of color, but it was pretty clear to me that my natural inclination for intricate details wouldn't allow me to just leave it at that. I knew I'd circle back to that foundational layer, sharpening the realism to make that tulip really pop. Now. This habit of revisiting my work isn't a negative. Rather, it's a quintessential part of how I approach my art. Switching gears for a moment, I've found that diving into the realm of direct painting has been a refreshing change in my usual routine. Normally, I spend a lot of my time meticulously building up layers in my paintings, which, don't get me wrong, is a different but rewarding challenge in itself. I'm a firm believer that when you try to do too many things at the same time, you're bound to compromise the quality of each individual task. Yet, there's undeniable value in shaking things up and stepping outside your comfort zone from time to time in order to expand your skill set. When you're dealing with direct painting, you're talking about a technique that demands a slightly different way of thinking. It puts a lot of emphasis on a well-rounded understanding of both the artistic and scientific aspects of mixing colors. So, in my ongoing journey for artistic evolution and to shake up the somewhat repetitive layering techniques that have become second nature in my traditional still life works, I make it a point to periodically explore and dabble in new methodologies. Doing so not only broadens the range of tools and techniques at my disposal but also infuses a sense of excitement and renewed energy into my creative endeavors.